Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of. Spirits of the Old South rise from the grave. No one rests in peace on these haunted plantations. And scientists claim that alien microbes may be headed our way. Will our own space program bring a doomsday virus to Earth? Evil has many faces, but none strike fear like the one we know as Satan. Does Lucifer rule in hell, or is he lurking among us right now? We'll go in search of the devil. We are your children. And caught in the crosshairs, this beautiful young woman has no place to hide. An easy target for psychic spies. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. The lush plantations of the American South stand as monuments to an era marked by beauty and brutality. With this troubled legacy, it is no surprise that these grand estates are rumored to play host to frightening displays of paranormal activity. This story takes us to the heart of Dixie in search of haunted plantations. Louisiana, home of splendid plantations, southern hospitality, and gracious living, is also home to something more. I never believed in ghosts before, but it's, I saw something. You can sense that, you know, you're not alone. I still can't explain what I've seen other than tell you I know it's not something natural. Oak Alley and the Myrtles are two of the region's finest plantations. They hearken back to an era of grace and opulence that once made Louisiana the jewel of the South. Today, these rooms stand as silent reminders of that time. Beautiful, well-tended, and apparently empty. But many claim the plantations are inhabited by ghosts. Caretakers and frightened tourists alike have reported mysterious episodes reflecting the mansion's dark pasts. We have had a few guests that left us before their evening was over for one reason or another. The ghostly encounters mark a blood-stained history of slavery, tragedy, and murder. There are ghosts that can wreak havoc in one's life. There's been cases where ghosts have attacked people. There are cases, uh, you know, not, not only psychic attacks, but physical attacks. Oak Alley is aptly named for its 28 majestic live oaks. The lush canopy they create has been featured in several movies, including the Anne Rice thriller, Interview with a Vampire. Not all of Oak Alley's shadows, however, are cast by its famous trees. There are apparently some spirits of some type that are still in this house that haven't been settled for some reason, and they're still lingering around. Oak Alley's mystical locale attracts tourists from around the world. As a tour guide, Andre Jacobs has been a witness to the alarming reactions from anxious sightseers. There's a place upstairs which was sometimes used as a guest room, sick room, or even a morning room for funerals, where some of the young ladies have approached that area, seem to not be able to catch their breath. There's something affecting them. They, you know, some of them have even felt like something was actually strangling them at that moment, and they just have to walk away from the tour. Andre will never forget his own chilling, supernatural encounter. I was only here about two months when I was sitting upstairs waiting for a tour to come up to me. 
I was getting bored and uh, decided to look downstairs to see if one of the ladies was down there for me to talk to. Well, I didn't see them, but as I looked down, there was an image of a girl in a white dress. Of course, I turned away right away, thinking, well, it must be the light from underneath the floor reflecting into my eyes. Well, about 10 minutes later, there it was again. For about two hours, I was shaking. It's like I couldn't shake it off. It just uh, affected me in that way. A possible rationalization for the incident only added to Andre's terror. One of the ladies, uh, well, in a joking way, was uh, telling me one day, well, you know, you dressed up here as the uh, plantation owner. The little girl may have thought you were her father. And that sort of shook me that day. It did give me a strange feeling. I've never forgotten that. It is believed that the ghost was that of a girl who died mysteriously on the third floor of the mansion in the 1800s. P.T. Dugas was giving a tour when she and her group encountered a paranormal force. I had just come out of the living room with about 35 people. And as they walked into the dining room, a candle fell off a candlestick onto the table. I thought nothing of it. I thought it was just the people walking into the room and the vibration of closing the doors. A gentleman was standing right by. He put the candlestick back in the candle holder. Thought nothing of it. I went on to the opposite end of the room, started talking like I usually do, and all of a sudden that same candle flew halfway across the room, landed on the floor. Everybody stayed with their mouth open. They were just shocked. There are no records to explain the source of this bizarre activity, and the history of Oak Alley remains shrouded in the past. But this is not the only haunted plantation. Some 90 miles away along the Mississippi River is the Myrtles. In 1796, this stately plantation was built with the sweat of slave labor. Today, it is a bed and breakfast, one which promises anything but a good night's rest. A lot of times, guests are awoke by a child's cry. Tour director Hester Eby has worked at the most haunted place in America for the past 16 years. When I first started working here, I said, oh yeah, you know, this is just something that, that's said. But after working for about two weeks or so, doors opening that you know you've locked, or you can sense someone around even though you can't see them. You just feel like if I should turn around right now, someone is right behind me. I would be right in their face. You'd hear the footsteps, you'd hear the door open and close, and you could just feel them. I felt them like standing over the bed looking at us. They were checking us out. Paranormal investigator Kalila Smith led several group examinations of the Myrtles. Rudy Raven is a member of Smith's crew. I've experienced things that basically like, you know, basically drop your equipment and run out the door. These ghost hunters use state-of-the-art equipment to document many of their findings. We use a lot of uh, regular 35 millimeter film, uh, infrared film. Uh, we had night vision on the digital cameras. I'm freezing. I'm covered with chills right now. Something's on me right now. Whoa, did you see something just fly by? Whoa, there it is again. Watch. All right, we've got activity in here. You feel how cold it's getting? We brought in uh, non-contact thermometers. We started picking up temperatures going down below 60 degrees, which is highly unusual. 57 degrees. It's 57 degrees in this one spot over here. Also, the windows were covered with frost just in these two rooms. Oh, this thing's going crazy. Y'all ought to see this. Look at this. It's, it jumped back up to, it's going to 68 to 75, 83. We started hearing voices like whispering, door slamming shut, handprints appearing on the mirrors. We tried wiping them off. It does not wipe off. Heard some knocking and some low voices. And uh, we also heard the crystals on the chandelier clinking together. This chandelier hangs in a bedchamber known as the voodoo room. A little girl once spent her last days here, dying of yellow fever. In an effort to cure their daughter, where doctors couldn't help, they brought in a voodoo priestess to do a ritual for her in hopes of healing her. Now, unfortunately, the child died. As penance for not being able to heal her, they hung the voodoo priestess from the chandelier. Some guests have went so far to say that they've got a bit warm in the voodoo room, pull their covers back, wake an hour or so later and be tucked in tightly. And of course they were not happy, so they did leave us before their evening was over. E.B. recounts the plantation's tragic history. In the early 1820s, Judge Clark Woodruff was the owner. 
He had married the first owner's daughter, General David Bradford's daughter, Sarah. And supposedly, through the time that they were together, Judge Woodruff also took on a mistress who was one of his house servants. That house servant was Chloe, a young slave girl with an unfortunate habit. She was caught eavesdropping on some of the family business, and she had been forewarned about eavesdropping. Her punishment was swift and harsh. The judge was upset. He ordered her left ear to be removed. He then stripped Chloe of her household duties and sentenced her back to the slave quarters. In reply, she baked the birthday cake for his oldest daughter and said to have used the juices from the oleander leaf. It let off a liquid very similar to arsenic. She thought if she made the children ill, she'd be able to prove that she was the person to take care of them, and then she would be brought back into the household. But Chloe's foolish plan took a tragic twist. The judge's wife and two daughters died, and the servant girl paid the ultimate price. Chloe was hung by an angry mob and then thrown in the river. But many insist that Chloe remains imprisoned on the plantation and offer proof for their assertions. This photo was taken by proprietor Tita Moss. Along with the shapes of two children on the roof, Chloe herself can be seen hanging in the trees. I got a photograph right behind the sofa where they said the children were seen a lot, the two little girls, and there was some misty fog back there. But why are the plantations possessed with their slain inhabitants? What is the reason for the tormenting poltergeist activity? We've got a large amount of murders. You had like 10 murders here, and that's a lot in a very, very small concentrated area. Also, this property was originally acquired by uh, General William Bradford, and it was believed to be Indian burial ground. But the graves were located on the site where Bradford wanted to build his house. So the general callously exhumed and burned the Indian remains. I think that's where it all began with the Myrtles, and it just kind of domino affected after that. The dominoes finally stopped falling in 1920 when the Myrtles overseer was brutally robbed and stabbed to death on the property. The killer was never found and to this day the crime remains unsolved. These were untimely deaths, they were unjust deaths, there was a lot of strong emotion behind these deaths so that sort of sets the stage for the spirit to hang around a little bit. And any time you come in and uns unsettle that and, and tamper with that, the spirits tend to get a little upset over that. Skeptics believe the spooky occurrences are nothing more than the mind playing tricks, a billowing curtain or odd reflection of light. But the cynicism doesn't fly with the local folk. For them, the haunting spirits of the plantations are very real and here to stay. I believe that they're here and I don't have to see them. They don't have to prove themselves to me. I can sense it. Coming up, is someone you know in service to Satan? Hail Satan. And government spies use telepathy to zero in on human targets. But first, Micro-invaders threaten the human race. It could unleash a pandemic of uh, biblical proportions and otherwise uh, destroy Earth's delicate ecosystems. Are we ready to fight? One of our deadliest enemies is making a comeback, and we may be in for the fight of our lives. More lethal than bullets, tiny microbes can strike the human body, overriding all defenses and leaving death in their wake. These killer bacteria may crawl out of the jungle, breathe in the test tubes of a terrorist laboratory, or even, some say, arrive here from the deepest reaches of outer space. There is no immunity from the doomsday virus. We look to the stars and the exploration of outer space for answers to mankind's deepest questions and the solutions to our biggest problems. But could our hunger for information about these distant worlds bring about our downfall? Science writer Barry DiGregorio is co-author of Mars, 
the living planet. The threat of Mars sample return mission is bringing back an organism from the surface of Mars that we have no idea how to deal with here on this planet. We are basically going to have a cannonball filled with Martian soil come back from the surface of Mars, enter the Earth's atmosphere without a parachute, and impact somewhere in the Utah desert where it will be taken to a level four biohazard containment facility. De Gregorio's fear, which is shared by others, is that the Martian soil samples will contain an alien microbe a virus that will wreak apocalyptic destruction on an unsuspecting Earth. One of the scientists on the Viking mission in 1976 has, for the last 26 years, said that the surface of Mars contained life. That scientist is Dr. Gilbert Levin. He was chosen by NASA to be part of the mission's biology team and now heads the bioresearch group Spherix. Some people look on the risk of returning a sample from Mars as infinitely small. Well, let's even say that it is very, very small. We have only one Earth. We don't know much about what those organisms on the surface of Mars could do potentially to Earth's ecosystems. The fears of De Gregorio and Levin have their basis in fact. The Earth is already the victim of a devastating virus of unknown origin, the Ebola virus. Ebola is a very lethal, acute, infectious disease. Dr. C.J. Peters is the former head of special pathogens for the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. Ebola virus causes people to die and the epidemics have had mortality rates around 90 percent for the most serious strain. Deadlier and more contagious than the AIDS virus, this malevolent and mysterious microbe first surfaced in the country of Zaire and has terrorized the African continent ever since. It showed up in 1976. It caused two major epidemics and then it disappeared. And it was essentially gone, except for the Kikwit episode in 89, until it came back in 1995. And it caused a, a massive epidemic. The cruelest of killers, it tortures its victims until they succumb to a gruesome death. So you essentially die the death of a thousand cuts. You have small deaths all over your body. In fact, afflicting all your organs. This insidious disease, found in tissue, body fluids, and even tears, is undetectable in its early stages. And once it makes its presence known, it's too late for the victims. We have no treatment. We cannot give a drug that will inhibit the growth of the virus and stop it from causing all the problems that it does. Where did this organism come from? Scientists have no answers, only questions. It belongs to a virus family that we just don't understand. We don't know what its natural reservoir is. We don't understand its own economy, how it gets from one day to the next and spreads from uh, uh, animal to animal. And we don't understand how it infects people. Ebola's past may be an unsolved mystery but there's nothing mysterious about its future. We know that Ebola infects humans. Those humans can get on a plane, fly directly to the U.S. and develop the disease. They may not even know they've been exposed. Is Ebola a harbinger of things to come once the Mars soil samples return? Do we dare risk importing microbes from an unknown world? Dr. Ross McVie of the American Museum of Natural History 
has been studying the disappearance, the extinction of the mammals during the Pleistocene era. And he has come to the conclusion that some sort of hyper disease caused 250 species of animals to disappear in a very short period of time. Uh, what we have to consider here is have pieces of Mars or another planet landed on our Earth at one time and the organisms inside them unleashed some sort of devastating disease. NASA insists that we have nothing to fear, for the Mars samples will probably contain only dead organic matter. But NASA has been wrong before. After the Viking space probe first made contact with Mars in 1976, the space agency declared that the planet's soil and atmosphere were incompatible with life, for there were no organic compounds and no evidence of standing water. Two decades later, they were forced to admit that they were wrong and that Mars, in fact, contains both. Things can go wrong with uh, technology and there's the element of human error. With a Mars sample return, if you could imagine a capsule being filled with Ebola, would you want that coming down anywhere uh, in, in your territory? I can't imagine that anyone in the state of Utah will be looking forward to the return of this sort of sample. NASA promises that the canisters will have protective coatings and will be handled with the highest level of security. But Levin's own experiences with NASA leave him less than reassured. I'm worried about the Mars sample return mission because I saw what happened when they returned the moon rock. The moon rock was returned to a high quarantine facility with the same precautions that NASA is now advocating for Mars sample. But the sample escaped. Despite all the precautions, it escaped. Moon rocks were burglarized from a Louisiana laboratory, stolen from a transport van, and even lost in the mail. If the same thing happens to a Mars sample and it escapes to our environment, the soil, the water, the atmosphere, it could find something it likes there and take root. It could unleash uh, a pandemic of uh, biblical proportions and otherwise uh, destroy Earth's delicate ecosystems. Our understanding of what constitutes life is narrow. Can we trust that we would even recognize an alien danger if we saw it? A Mars microbe would be invisible to the human eye, and it could lie dormant for years. We would be incapable of controlling or curing any disease it might create. And once it was unleashed, it could never be taken back. Is that a risk, something we want to take as a human civilization? I think that the Mars sample return mission isn't a national issue, that it's a global issue, and that we all have a voice in this. Are we on the brink of bringing another killer microbe to Earth? One that will make Ebola pale by comparison? Could Mars be the home of the ultimate doomsday virus? Do we dare risk our survival to find out? Later, these are the ultimate smart weapons, psychic spies. And is there a demonic hold on your heart? Some people have sympathy for the devil. Hail Satan. Next on In Search Of. Lucifer, Satan, the devil. By any name, he is the embodiment of evil. But is Satan an actual creature set loose upon humanity? Or is he merely a reflection of the darkest impulses that dwell in each of us? In this next story, we unlock the door to our darkest fears and stare straight into the face of the devil. Hail Satan! Open wide the gates of hell and come forth from the abyss. He is the enemy of a, a society that is loving and caring toward one another. The devil is a destroyer. The devil is a paralyzer. The devil is a liar. The devil kills. In the name of Satan, ruler of the earth, 
King of hell, come forth from the pit, bestow the blessings of hell upon us. For we are your children, and we invoke thee this night. We use the images of Satan and Lucifer to inspire us. The devil. As lord of the underworld, he is a vessel for all that is evil. He is the adversary of mankind that bears a thousand nightmares. But is the devil real, or a creation of religious authorities to manipulate the masses? Or is he, as some believe, a figure to be worshipped? Our search for answers begins in Loch Ness, Scotland. It was here in 1899 that the occult master Alistair Crowley conducted one of the most notorious experiments in history. Parents, you do not know by the ancients of the days, I'm angry. Crowley himself claimed he was the great beast, a satanic monster mentioned in the biblical book of Revelation. Crowley's occult plan was to conjure the most vile of evil demons and force them to do his bidding. The setting for his most notorious ritual would be Boleskine House, Crowley's mansion near the shores of Loch Ness. Because he wanted some quiet place where he could practice the magic of a magician called Abraham Alin the Mage. And it's a fairly long ritual and would usually take about six months or even longer. Some believe that Crowley was able to summon over a hundred hideous demons using a combination of ancient religious practices. In any event, something went terribly wrong at Boleskine House. During the several months it took Crowley to conduct the ritual, disaster struck many who were on the premises. A workman employed to renovate the house attacked Crowley and had to be locked in the basement. The caretaker went on a drunken spree and tried to kill his wife. Crowley's housekeeper disappeared without a trace. At one point, Crowley accidentally used a butcher's bill to write a magic incantation. Shortly after, the butcher chopped through his own arm, severed an artery, and died. But then, Crowley left Boleskine House before completing the ritual. If you invoke the spirits to come and help you out or to teach you or whatever, there's something important that has to be done afterwards. You banish them. You clear the air. He never did that. Crowley eventually vacated Boleskine House, but many of the subsequent owners suffered grave misfortune. I think anybody who tries to control the spiritual world is going to make a mess of it because these spiritual forces and, and entities don't want to be controlled and they will come in, pretend to be helpful and then take over themselves. As for Alistair Crowley, he gained nothing but misery. One of his wives was committed to an insane asylum, and Crowley himself died in 1947, a penniless heroin addict whose life was filled with horror and gloom. It seems the devil had taken his due. Throughout history, the devil has been considered the lord of lies, and that is his trick. He offers you something wonderful, something beautiful, something you could never attain on your own, and you just have to possess it. But then invariably, once you've gone into the bargain with Satan, it goes horribly wrong. And of course, there's the phrase, be careful of what you wish for, you may get it. You do not give your soul to the devil for just a whistle and a smile. There is that warped hand that chokes and doesn't let go of you easy. It destroys. The devil is a destroyer. The devil is a paralyzer. The devil is a liar. The devil kills. Alistair Crowley was not the last famous person to cross paths with Satan. Some say the greatest blues guitarist of all time, Robert Johnson, may also have fallen victim to the devil, losing his life and soul. A mediocre musician, Johnson briefly disappeared from the music scene. He quickly returned with a talent that seemed supernatural to those who had heard him before. 
It is now said that he met the devil at this crossroads, selling his soul in return for musical genius. In 1938, Johnson was poisoned by a rival, and he died a few days after singing his famous lyric, Hello Satan, I believe it's time to go. That fascination with the dark side can be heard even now, in the music of death metal bands like Sadistic Intent and controversial rocker Marilyn Manson. Manson calls himself the Antichrist Superstar. His followers are known as the Satanic Army. Manson was inspired by the most notorious advocate for Satan since Aleister Crowley. His name was Anton LaVey. Hail Satan! And we'll enter his Church of Satan when we come back. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Does the devil walk among us? What form would he take? How would we recognize him? He comes to us in the disguise of beauty. He comes to us in the disguise of comfort. He comes to us in the disguise of pleasure. And so instead of the traditional evil images, he comes to us softly. And that's why he becomes so palatable in so many lives. And that's why so many lives are destroyed. And we accept that because we all want to be successful. We all want to be comfortable. We all want glory. By promising that glory to all who follow him, Anton LaVey changed the face of devil worship when he formed the Church of Satan in 1966. This San Francisco residence was home to LaVey and his followers. From within these walls, he invoked the spirit of Satan. Be with us tonight. Place us in a position of sovereignty that we might look down upon our inferiors and cast their kin into the morass of mediocrity where they belong. LaVey believed that man's carnal nature, his lust, greed, vengeance, and ego had been unfairly labeled evil by Christianity. His influence was widespread. The invocation that Anton LaVey conceived of in the Satanic Bible is just a general calling forth the demons from hell and having them manifest your desires in this plane of existence. Blanche Barton read the Satanic Bible as a young girl. I've been a Satanist since I was 12 years old. With LaVey's death in 1997, Barton took over the Church of Satan. And the legacy of Aleister Crowley and Anton LaVey continues to attract followers through a group known as the Thelemic Order of the Golden Dawn. We certainly don't fear the devil. It represents the very principle of freedom within. David Carabim and his followers practice a religion based upon the work of Aleister Crowley. One of the things that we teach is to overcome fear. Fear nothing. Fear is an illusion. Each person has to come to a realization of their own law. To let others dictate to us what is best for us is to miss the whole point of existence. We are free. If there is a war between good and evil, it seems each soul hangs in the balance. And for those who go in search of the devil, a warning. It's been said that the devil's cruelest trick is to convince us that he does not exist at all. Is this woman being stalked by a psychic spy? We'll put his telepathic powers to the test. Next, on In Search Of.
you are about to enter the world of America's secret soldiers. Special agents armed with the powers of extrasensory perception. They can pinpoint a human target thousands of miles away, and absolutely nothing can shield their vision. As members of a highly classified CIA program, they waged a silent war using telepathic powers. Join us as we go in search of psychic spies. The full capabilities of the human brain go far beyond the tasks of everyday living. And some believe they have developed extraordinary mental powers. One of them is remote viewing. Remote viewers claim that they use extrasensory perception to gain a clear image of distant objects, people, and places. Exploring the limits of human consciousness, Stanford researchers Dr. Hal Putoff and Russell Targ developed the concept of remote viewing in 1972. It's a psychic ability, which means that you have direct access and direct experience to sights, sounds, smells, tastes, activities, and the visual representation of what's going on in a place that's hidden from your ordinary senses. Remote viewers believe that the basic concept of all extrasensory perception, or ESP, is that information swirls around us all the time, like a sky full of stars. Electrified particles contain impressions that are available if we know how to use them. So remote viewing is more attention management than it is anything else. This is the collective unconscious. We're immersed in that. Retired U.S. Army Major Ed Dames is a remote viewing pioneer. Dames was part of a military program that developed the technique. The program was an Army program. It moved from Army to the Defense Intelligence Agency and then to the Central Intelligence Agency and became Project Stargate there. Project Stargate was designed to gain access to the military secrets of countries hostile to the U.S. Their mission involved tracking Soviet submarines, locating missile silos, identifying germ warfare labs, and uncovering the whereabouts of rogue leaders. Colonel John Alexander was one of the officers who championed the use of remote viewing for military purposes. There was a great deal of effort to keep it secret because they were afraid of the giggle factor. I mean, here they were spending government money on projects that some would view as quite questionable. The remote viewers were able to deliver success where other agencies had failed. Remote viewing uh, was used by the military in a number of cases that were very dramatic. Uh, one of them was the Dozier case, where General Dozier had been kidnapped by the Red Brigade. And the information that was developed on that was extremely accurate. With only a black and white photo to start the process, one remote viewer was able to pinpoint the city, building, and room where General Dozier was being held. He was later rescued by counter-terrorism commandos and returned to American soil. Ed Dames left Project Stargate years ago. He now teaches civilians and claims we can all be trained to use our minds like radios, tuning into the unique electromagnetic signals that emanate from every individual or object. In Search of wanted to put this claim to the test, so we secretly planted a human target in the Los Angeles area. We then challenged one of Ed Dame's students, Erin Donahue, to determine her exact location. Erin Donahue's only clue was the target's first name, Caprice. The technique speaks for itself. Based on my personal experience, it will uh, work. We'll be able to suss out this truth or this location.
45 minutes into the test, Aaron began to sketch what remote viewers refer to as a blueprint of the site and the target. Smells. It's all flat. It's flat. Angular textures. Smooth, smooth. Sound, sounds. Brushing, whooshing. Flat. Coming up. The results are, to say the least, astounding. And down. We'll show them to you when we come back. This woman is a target on the psychic battlefield. She is being stalked telepathically by this remote viewer. His only clue to her location is the woman's first name. The psychic spy is Aaron Donahue, and he was trained by this man, former U.S. Army Major Ed Dames. Since leaving the military, Ed Dames has been called in on the investigation of flight TWA-800 and several manhunts, including the search for the notorious Unabomber. He relies on a skill known as remote viewing, using extrasensory perception to locate distant targets. But does this really work? We return to Aaron Donahue and the remote viewing scenario we set up earlier. You'll recall that we've placed our human target in an undisclosed location, giving Erin nothing to work with but her first name. Erin is sequestered in a hotel, miles from the target site. With no access to a phone and under constant surveillance, he has no contact with the outside world. Dimensions. Flat. Even. Bridged. Like a snapshot slowly developing, Aaron's sketches come into sharper focus. Cool. Cool. Wet. Okay, it's all trenched, flat, trenched. Vague shapes, lines, and circles begin to form a more complete picture of Aaron's remote vision. There is a spinning structure, turning slowly. The final sketches represent automobiles, airplanes, and a unique architecture that leads this remote viewer to only one possible conclusion. The question was, where is Caprice? The answer is, encounter at LAX here in California. Aaron is dead on target. Using his remote viewing skill, he has zeroed in on the exact location of his quarry, a restaurant at Los Angeles International Airport. By conventional standards, Aaron Donahue's success seems inexplicable and astonishing. As a product of the strange alliance between psychics and the Pentagon, it seems that remote viewing has opened up a new world of perception. With their mind-bending powers, these psychic spies bear witness to the awesome possibilities contained in the most powerful weapon of all, the human mind. Thanks for watching In Search Of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night. Oh.